thank you for this morning that we can worship together, that we can be a part of your great work in this, in this town, in this place. And we thank you that you are ever faithful to us. You always work in our lives. You move with power and might. You touch us with your compassion. Lord, we bless you and we thank you. And we ask your blessing upon us now. You push back any and everything that's dark and let the light of Jesus shine in this place. Push out every distraction that would minimize or weaken his good word and fill us with your word, Lord, that we might walk in your ways. Sweet Holy Spirit, the living God, push back everything that would stand against Jesus and fill this room with his light and with his joy, with his peace as we open the scriptures. Anoint us, Lord, that we would hear your word, your voice, and be stronger for it. We ask us in your great name, Lord Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, we bless you and we seek your blessing. Amen. Please be seated. We're starting, um, I just lost my, there we go. We're starting a new sermon series, The Most Meaningful Verse. And for those of you who were here last year, it's, it's really, in a sense, a revisiting of, of uh, something we did last year. About almost two years ago, as early as October, I was thinking ahead to the sermons that would be taking place the next summer. You have to plan ahead and think ahead a little bit. And I, I confess, I was just at an absolute loss and what to preach? You know, what book of the Bible should we preach? Is there a subject? And I, it was just blank. And as I pondered and wrestled and prayed, uh, I, I just decided I'm going to take a, an easy way out. I'm just going to choose 10 or so of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, and we'll do those for the summer. It's easier because it was summer. You know, we're all in and out, including me. We have all that vacations and it's hard to do a series that follows a linear progression because we're just gone, all of us. So I thought this will be perfect. We'll just look at a whole bunch of the top ten or so by, uh, verses in the Bible and we'll just go from one to the next. And, and while I'm on vacation, the other pastors can pick it up. It's going to be great. But I made the mistake of praying about it. And I felt like the Lord said very clearly, he said, I don't want you to pick the verses. I want you to find other people in the congregation and ask them their favorite verse or most meaningful verse, a verse that's been powerful in their lives. And you ask them, and then ask them to give a testimony of why that verse matters in their lives. So I did that last year. We had 13 people, and if you were in the church, most of you, of course, were. And we had 13 people through the scope of the summer, uh, younger and older, men and women, people who are fairly new to the faith and people who'd been in the faith for a long time, people who are new to the church, people who've been in the church a long time. And we heard a lot of different perspectives. And it went very well, and I thought we'd do it again this, this summer. And so we have 11 people that I've asked. And each week, they have given, those of us on the preaching staff, they have given us the verse. This Sunday, we're looking at Philippians 4, 4 through 7. And, and a little later, you'll hear from Teresa Zavala. I asked her, she was actually the first person I asked that she would be a part of this year's sermon series and she gave us this verse. And the reason we're looking at this is it's really a biblical idea. If you go back to Psalm 119, it has this word, and it's voiced in a lot of different places. Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And we hold in this church that the Bible is not just a bunch of ancient words that are meaningless to us today in a contemporary modern society. We, we don't hold that the scriptures are just simply inspired like a poem is inspired that it's something powerful and, and human. And we believe that as the living God touched, anointed, and inspired the prophetic writers, the biblical writers, that his word was given to them. That as David voiced his heart in the Psalms, God's word was in that and inspiring it and guiding it. When Jeremiah wrote his prophecies or dictated them to Baruch, or when the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter writes a letter to one of the precious churches under their care, or Mark writes a gospel, something that had never been done before, and he writes a gospel. We believe that these people were not only writing and speaking from their heart, they were writing the Word of God and something God wanted us to know. And we believe that this Word, that when you take the Bible and you trust God to speak to it, He fills us. He anoints us. He, he guides us. They're not empty words. They're not simply empty ancient words. But his word guiding us and comforting us and, and leading us. 
his word that makes us strong and, and helps us go forward. And so it's with this in mind that we come to this series with the belief that God's word it really is meaningful and it's a light to our path. And you'll hear from 11 different people through the summer. They've given us the verse. We did not choose it, the, the preaching staff. Why we will speak on it and describe a little bit of what it means. They will come up afterwards and say how this particular verse touched them, led them, meant something to them, and was one of the most meaningful verses in their life. So today's verse, it would be one, in all honesty, that I might pick. I first memorized this passage when I was in high school, and I've had this passage as something dear since uh, for over 40 years. If you've spent any length of time in the church, you have no doubt heard it. You may have memorized it. No doubt you've clung to it as a beautiful promise. Listen now to the word of God. This is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I tell you, rejoice in the Lord at all times. Let the gentleness of your spirit be seen by every person. For the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything whatsoever. But in every prayer and every petition, with thanksgiving, lay your requests before God. And the God and the peace of God, which goes beyond anything you can imagine, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord is a priceless passage. It is so good and filled with such good promise. And let's walk through it a little bit before Teresa comes and explains why she picked this passage. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. In Greek, this word rejoice, appearing twice, spelled the same way, it takes a, a particular form. And we don't have it in English. It's called an imperative, and it means a command. It's spelled a certain way so that as soon as you look at it, you realize that he's not just saying you should rejoice or you might rejoice or you could rejoice. It's saying rejoice. This is an order. This is a command. And it might seem a little strange to be commanded to be joyful. It, it seems weird that no matter what you might be facing, if there's hard times, sad times, difficult times, you're, you're facing confusing times. And what somebody, what you hear is you need to be joyful. I remember when Linda had Sari, and she struggled with a, a postpartum depression, as happens sometimes. And she was just overwhelmed with it. And she'd be crying a lot, holding this beautiful little daughter, and just crying. And we had countless people in our church up in Washington come up and say, you should be happy. I know, she'd cry. It's not that easy when you're going through hard times. It almost sounds like, when it says these words, rejoice, it's an order. At all times, rejoice. I'll tell you again that Paul, it sounds like he's saying, man up or get over it. Just get over it. You're going through hard times. There's a divorce in your life or your kids are going in a difficult and sad or troubling direction. Get over it. Rejoice. You've had a rough diagnosis from a doctor or you're facing a biopsy and you're afraid. And the, the word is, well, just be joyful. Accept it. Celebrate. It seems a little out of touch. It seems a little unrealistic. But it really isn't. And what Paul has in mind is he's trying to get our focus on something other than the problem. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Notice that he says rejoice. The letter to Philippi, to the church, the Philippians, is often called the letter of joy. And joy characterizes it from the very beginning to the very end. And Paul is writing from hardship. And sorry, he's writing from prison. And yet joy is the theme that just weaves through the whole thing. Joy is different than happiness. And notice that he doesn't say you should be happy. You should celebrate. Be happy. It's not happiness. It's joy. Because happiness, while it's a good thing, you can be happy for a new car. You can be happy for a new puppy. You can be happy for a new job or graduation. Happiness depends upon happenings, the events in your life. But joy is something different. 
Joy is something deeper. Joy in the Bible is something that comes not because of the events around us going well or being smooth, but because of something far more profound and and far more lasting. And it's the faithfulness and the goodness and the love of Jesus. And so Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. He's not discounting hardship. In fact, the whole passage in the whole of Philippians and the whole of the Bible talks about living lives in a hurting and broken world. It's filled with sorrows, and it's filled with hardships. It's filled with difficulties. And these things hit every single person. And Paul is not writing to say, well, just ignore them. Or put on a positive look. Take on positive power of thinking, optimistic thoughts, and your world will get better. He's saying, you can rejoice even in the midst of them. Because in the hard times, and the sad times, and the lonely times, God hasn't left you. He's there. He's present. Rejoice in the Lord because the Lord is faithful and he's good and he's ever true. Now verse 5, it comes along the next line. It says, again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all. Let your gentleness be known to all. It almost feels like when you read this passage, Paul is just throwing out a bunch of little ideas, principles, values that we should live by. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle, tender nature be seen by everybody. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. It sounds like he's just throwing out a smattering of good principles to live by that are unconnected. But I think the opposite is actually true, that these are woven together and they depend upon each other. And Paul's not making a leap in this next line when he moves from rejoice in the Lord always and now into let your gentleness be seen by all. He's actually building upon it and moving into the principle in the next line. That word gentleness in Greek is a very strong word, and it's hard to translate with just one word, like gentleness. It it talks about an attitude, a spirit that comes out of our lives, a characteristic of our lives, whereby you just exude peace and calm. It describes an attitude, a characteristic that's humble by nature. Someone who's not argumentative. Somebody who's not always demanding that their rights be honored, that their voice be heard, that their way be followed. It's not talking about somebody who's shrill and loud and obstinate. It's talking about somebody who's calm and at peace. And Paul says that spirit should be seen by everybody. To be so alive and so real in you that it actually bubbles out of your life without even knowing it. Maybe you've known people in your life, I've known people in their life, that the power of God, the presence of God is so real, so concretely real, that they are just at peace. And it doesn't mean they're happy all the time, and it doesn't mean that their life is problem-free, because no such person exists. But it means in the midst of the trauma and the hardship, they have an absolute trust that the Lord is there, and they're going to be okay. It'll work. And in the hard diagnoses, the frightful times and the lonely times, the lack of income or lack of job or lack of friends or lack of home, they're not alone. And Jesus is with them. And that peace is so real, it bubbles out and can be seen. A heavenly reality seen in the lives of normal human beings. And what does it reveal? Well, the very next line, the Lord is near. In Greek, it's only three Three words, very brief. The Lord is near. And I don't know if there's any better words in the whole Bible. I mean, when you think about it, isn't that true? I can't think of any better words, better principle, better idea in the entire Bible. I can't think of any philosophy or promise that the world has made or its leaders or philosophers have made that is better than those three words. The Lord is near. You know, I'll bet you every one of us in this room has felt like he's not. I'll bet you every one of us in this room has gone through times where you feel like God is, not anything, is anything but near. And you feel like you're going through the hard times and the scary times, the lonely times, and, and you're alone. That you're facing a, a biopsy, and it feels like you're alone. You're going through a horrific divorce, or your kids are rebelling, and they're mad at you and alienated from you. And you feel like you're alone. But this is the defining word. These three words are the defining, guiding 
words of this whole passage. That in the midst of the fearful diagnosis, God is right next to you. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't, as the popular song say, watch us from a distance. He is near us. He is beside us. He is with us. He hovers around us. He walks beside us. He dwells within us. He is near. The Lord is near, and he never abandons us. He never forsakes us. He never leaves us alone. And while it might feel like it sometimes, the fact of the matter is these words are what are true. The Lord is near. For Paul, it probably meant a couple different things. First, it meant that he just believed Jesus was coming back imminently. Any day, it could happen. The whole early church believed that, that the return of Jesus, the great Jesus who lived and walked and died on the cross and rose again, this Jesus is coming back and he will set everything right. He will come back enthroned in glory and the whole world will see who he is and what he is. And it was the the hope of the early church that this would come soon. And that's probably the primary meaning that Paul has in this verse, that the Lord is near. His coming is imminent. It could happen at any time. We, in our day, 2,000 years later, it doesn't feel as pressing. It doesn't often feel as real that the the Lord's return is near. But it's still one of the central teachings of the Bible. That Jesus will come back any time. He'll come back when we least expect it. He is going to be popping into time and space any time. It could be tonight. It could be a hundred years. It could be a thousand years. But we should be expecting it and yearning for it and longing for it. The Lord is near. He is breaking into time and space to fix all things. But there's another meaning in this, and I think it's perfectly legitimate. Without losing the fact that Jesus will return and losing that as our primary hope, these words, the Lord is near, carry a different meaning as well. He's near to us. He walks beside us. He, he is close to us. Luther wrote that God is closer to everything than anything is to itself. Isn't that a wild thought? God is closer to you than you are to your very self. I heard a youth worker once, way back in the day in young life, and he took that same theological idea and he, he, he put it in youth terms. He says, God is closer to you than a hole to a donut. He's, he's intimately beside us, close, connected. And this was the great hope. We think of Psalm 145. It says that the Lord is near to all those who call upon him. And we see that theme throughout the Psalms over and over and over. The Lord is near to the downtrodden. The Lord is near to the widows and the orphans. The Lord is near to the weak. The Lord is close to the humble. These simple words, they're the, the, the defining hope that we are not in this world and in this life and in its hardships alone. The Lord is near us. And so what does that mean? Well, it flows into the next line. Then don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious, worried, turning your insides upside down because of anxiety and fear and worry and stress. Don't. One of the things that's all through Paul's writings, he seems to love this word. It's a simple little word. Repeated in here. Words like always or only. And he says, don't be anxious about anything. Notice he doesn't say something like, for the most part, don't be anxious. Or don't be anxious about most things. There are surely some things that are legitimate to be anxious about, worried about, afraid of. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, don't be anxious about anything. It doesn't mean that the things that happen in our lives, the sorrowful things or hard things or lonely things, are to be dismissed flippantly, to be relegated or treated as if they're no big deal or they don't really matter, and just to... Man up, and face it, get over it. What Paul is trying to remind us is that in every situation, you can trust God. He's near. And so you don't have to be anxious about it. It might be hard, but he's close. It might be painful or difficult or frightening, but the Lord has not left you in it. And so you can have hope. It's not rejoice in the events that are going on around you. It's rejoice in the Lord, in his faithfulness, in his love for you in his sure and certain commitment to walk through this life and to see that you succeed. And so Paul says, don't ever be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything whatsoever. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. 
spells out a very clear path. He says, in everything that you're going through, pray. Two different words are used there for prayer, prayer and petition. They both could be translated prayer. But the first one is the idea of falling on your knees before God, of humble reverence, of an acknowledgement that you are his being, his creature, and he is God. You are human, frail and weak, and he is awesome and powerful, and you're coming before him into his very presence in a state of adoration, seeking his help. The petition is more the idea of laying out a list of hurts, needs, concerns, worries, desires, and laying them out and presenting them to him as facts, as just simple realities. And the two words are used by Paul to say, we come before God and we fall before him, we trust him as the great God, the maker of all things, and we lay out everything in our lives. And we do this not because he doesn't know what's going on, that we have to inform him about the difficulties and sorrows in our lives, we do this as an act of submission to him. That when I ask God to help me in a given area, it's not, I'm not telling him to inform him of that need or hurt or fear, but to surrender it to him. And to say, I want to give this to you. That my freedom from anxiety comes from giving it away and letting you carry it. My freedom and anxiety from anxiety comes from letting you take my problems and trusting that you have and you will again take care of me in the difficulties of my life. And that's why this word thanksgiving is so vitally important. Nothing kills anxiety faster than gratitude. Nothing. You see, gratitude is the awareness of good having been done to you. Gratitude is the response of good having been given or done to you. And so the more grateful a person is, the more gratitude just bubbles out of them, what it reveals is a person, a heart, that has understood that they are the recipient of much, freely given. Where there is no gratitude in a person's life, it's a reflection that they're not aware of what they've received. They're not aware of any gifts that's been given. They're not aware of the fact that they are the target of God's gracious, constant, reckless giving. And so Paul, he calls us to not just be praying, but to pray with thanksgiving, because when you pray with thanksgiving, it means you're constantly going back to all the times God answered those prayers. That every other time he touched me when I was afraid, he he was faithful, and he was good, and he was real, and he was powerful, and yes, thank you, God, I can trust you in this time. I can trust you in this event. I can trust you with these fears. Gratitude is the opening of our eyes to the wonders that God has already done. And the recognition and understanding of what God has already done is the surest and fastest way to put to death the anxiety and fear that governs the future. That what God has done in the past, we can be sure that he will do in the future. And so Paul says... Don't be anxious about anything. Don't ever be anxious, but lay everything before God. And your prayer is falling on your knees before him, and you're laying out your list and giving him everything that's on your heart and mind. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to him. And then look how it ends. It's beautiful. And the peace of God, which goes beyond anything you'll be able to comprehend, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, a whole sermon could be gone on just that simple little phrase, the peace of God. The Greek word is irene, but it really is touching the whole Old Testament concept of shalom. Shalom is one of the most beautiful words in the entire Bible. It means so much more than we tend to understand. It it doesn't simply mean the absence of conflict. It It does not mean simply that there's no war or fighting or strife. Shalom means that That's true, but your world is also filled with wholeness, with people who love you. It's not just the absence of strife, but the presence of friends and joy and peace and love, uh, of a world that's good, of a place where there's food and shelter and safety. Shalom covers the whole of our lives and describes every part of our lives being in a good place, in a good way. Every relationship, every feeling, every thought is right and good. 
So while that's the Hebrew word shalom, it's certainly what Paul has in mind when he says irene, the Greek word, the peace of God. It's another worldly sort of peace, that heavenly peace that comes down inside of us because we are so trusting of Jesus and we are so bound to him. We've given ourselves to him. We've fallen before him. We've yielded the whole of our lives to him, even in the hard times, that his peace falls upon us. And it's important to understand this, that it is his peace. It's the peace of God. This is not your peace that you've mustered up because you've just turned to positive thinking or more optimistic thoughts. That doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. This is not just working to, to make your world better by approaching it differently or taking in new habits. This is God's divine gift. It's the peace of God. It's a very characteristic of God, like God is holy, like God is loving, like God is pure and good. It's his very nature, and it falls upon those who come into his very presence and say, God, I'm struggling, and I'm hurting, and I'm alone, and I'm scared. And to come into his presence in reverence, bowing before him, and laying it all before him in trusting prayer, that his peace just falls upon us. It envelops us, and it wraps us up. I've watched God give peace to people in ways that I couldn't describe. I've seen so many people and had so many people tell me that they're in the midst of terrible, hard, grievous things. They've said to me, I can't explain it, but I'm, I'm at peace. It's as if they're saying, I know it's stupid. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's ridiculous that I would feel peace in this situation. But I do. I've seen God do it. I've seen God give his peace. He doesn't always give his healing, does he? We pray for people who are sick, and he doesn't always give his healing. But he always gives his peace. He always comes and says, I'm with you. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I'll never abandon you. And we have to understand that. That's what it means when it says the Lord is near. That he's never going to leave us and abandon us when life is hard. And that we can have peace in the midst of that. We can thus rejoice because of that peace, that God is near. And we have to admit, if we're really honest, there's a lot of things in life that just stink. Death stinks. I mean, probably most of us, if not all of us, except the newborn little infant, all of us know what death is. And we grieve by the loss that we faced. Maybe some of you are even thinking that death is on the doorstep with some that you love, and you're facing the prospect of loss. And the fact of the matter is it stinks. When you think about people struggling with addictions, and people who are homeless, people who are friendless, people who are, who are helpless, and it stinks. It's just not the way God made the world, and it's sad and it's tragic. But what would be truly bad is if we had to go through all those things alone. And what this passage says is that we're not free of the problems of this age and of this life. In a fallen and broken world, sinful conditions remain and always will until Jesus returns. But we can have peace. Not because of what we do or who we are or how we approach our lives, but because of who he is. That he is trustworthy and he is powerful and he is good and he has made our success his own aim. He has promised us good and he will fulfill it. And it's standing upon his own good character and his own faithfulness that all the good he has planned for us will succeed. And he is near to us. He doesn't watch from a distance. He doesn't step away. He is near to us. And so we can actually have peace in these hard and sad days. We can have peace in the midst of chaotic elections and Brexit and Syria. And we can have peace even amid the sorrows, peace in the Lord. And we can rejoice in the Lord because he'll take care of us and he will see us through and we will stand before him and be with him in that place where there's no sorrow and no death and no tears. He will win. And he is guaranteed that we will be with him. So there's a beautiful passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not fickle, empty words. Rejoice in the, world, the Lord always. The Lord is near. Let this so fill you that your gentleness and fearlessness just bubbles out of you. And the peace of God, 
which goes beyond anything you can understand. It will fill your hearts and your minds. It will guard them. The Greek word is an idea of having it in a safe, putting it in a, in a barred, safe place, your heart. God treasures your heart and mind so much that he wants to lock it away in a place of safety. And it's this peace of God that locks your hearts away, your minds, and keeps you safe in Christ Jesus. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. And I didn't pick it, though. Teresa picked it. And so, Teresa, will you come up and share with us why or how this is your most meaningful verse? Good morning. Many of you knew Paul Dugan and that he used to pray that the Lord would do whatever it took to bring, him, bring us to him. And I prayed that, too. But I didn't mean cancer. And when Mark first asked me to do this, my response was to say, oh no, I don't speak in front of people. But in my mind, immediately came the Philippians 4, 6, even as I was refusing, and I knew I couldn't deny the Holy Spirit. Nine months ago, I found out cancer had returned, even though this kind of cancer rarely does. And I knew what this meant because my closest friend died of ovarian cancer. And another dear friend has been fighting it for 12 years. It's really scary. On my way to work one morning, I was sitting in my car and I was just thinking and fretting about how sick I really am, which is difficult because I've always been a very healthy person, didn't even have a doctor. When the words came to me, be anxious for nothing, but in all things give thanks and praise to God. I immediately felt peace, and that peace has never left me. I knew they were from the Bible, and I had to look them up. And Philippians 4, 4, 7 says, Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God with thanksgiving, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And again, that peace has never left me. I still get sad about being sick. I've been a Christian for many years, and I know God loves me, but I've never really felt that love. It's hard to accept or receive love from a heavenly father when you've never known it from an earthly father and you've been abandoned by more than one and others whom you loved and who should have loved you. But what I think the Lord's really asking me is, do I trust him? And he is showing me that I can. And I pray that I reflect this daily, especially when gentleness of spirit is not one of my strong suits. It's something I've had to work on for many years. I think I do when I go into the oncology office and getting ready to get my infusions and the nurse tells me that she likes to see me laughing or when she comes over to change an infusion bag and I'm singing along to some song on the tablet that I bring with me. She tells me, I've never had anybody sing during chemotherapy. I just can't help singing. <laughs> the Lord has answered my long ago prayer He's drawn me into his word a lot more and into prayer. And I can have peace and joy only because I trust in God. And I believe he does have a good plan and a purpose for my life. And he is faithful. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Let's pray together for Teresa. And good word. <laughs> When she came down to my office this morning, we pray always every Sunday before we all start, and she came into prayer, walked down the hallway, and she goes, she, she was singing as she walked down the hall, saying, walking down that long, lonesome hallway, <laughs> as if she was going to the death house, <laughs> but you did, you did well, and I'm very grateful, and I want to do something a, a little different, I want to invite you, if you're willing to stretch your hands forward, the Bible says lay hands on each other, and so rather than have everybody come up, and we're going to pray for healing, I want to pray this cancer goes away. And so we're going to pray that together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Teresa and for 20 plus years here and her faithfulness in this church and for her walk with you through good times and bad times. I thank you for that. I thank you for her word today and her willingness to speak and, and share. 
I thank you that you were at work. I thank you that you gave her that verse in the car and that you've even more, you've given her what that verse signifies. You have given her peace. And I pray for more of that, Lord. I pray for peace to fall upon her, that it would fill her and bless her, that she would not even comprehend its depth and magnitude and the way that it carries her. Lord, come and fill her with your peace. But together, as a church family, we pray for healing. You can take away cancer, and you can bring your healing power. So in the name of Jesus, we pray you would blaze against every wrong cell in her body, that you would bring her complete restoration, that you would let her body be completely cancer-free, and that you would give her life and years together with us and living with you in this place. Bless my dear friend Teresa in the name of Jesus with your healing touch, and bless her with your peace in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks, my friend. Teresa asked this song that we would sing uh, as uh, in response to what she said. So, stay here. Jesus, draw.